Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yes, thank you. Everybody hear me okay? It's yeah. good? All right. Uh, oh, I get my password correct. Um, okay. Um, First of all, really great to be back in person. Uh, it's been a long, like we're all in our, you know, virtual worlds, and wow, it's been a long time. So that's uh, what a journey, uh, life changing, amazing. Um, so here uh, today, we're going to talk about the fastest creative supply chain on Earth. Um, for me, uh, I'm super passionate about this space, and um, I've spent a lot of time. Um, focusing on these, these problems that, that exist at these uh, very high-level enterprise um, uh, challenges that we have of getting content out the door. Um, you can follow along today if you want. Uh, if you uh, log into Optica.com, you can, it's, it can work on your phone, so you can see some dynamicness going on. If you care to do that, uh, there's a sign-up button. Um, I would encourage you guys to uh, think about this deeply because um, what you're going to see today is, is uh, a brand new sector in, in content supply chain. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a creative technologist. Uh, over the course of the, uh, my career, I've spent about $20 million in DAM. Uh, I've uh, built a lot of large enterprise creative supply chains, uh, obviously millions of assets. We all work with millions of assets. I've, I've seen some of the most complex security models on the planet. Uh, just to share a little bit of fun, um, well, I was on a, a project where we had to uh, hide Angelina Jolie from any assets that were actually in the dam. So we actually had content flowing through the dam where no one could actually see the actress in the film. So that's one. Another one on Star Wars was uh, having assets actually flow through the dam that actually no one could actually see. So in the dam, but you cannot look at it at all. So yes, those, are, those, those use cases do exist, and I've played around with that. So that's um, a little bit of history there. Um, just to level set a little bit, uh, we're going to be talking upstream. So to me, in my experience, there's a pretty strong divide between content creation and business enrichment. And it's not necessarily conscious that we, we go through this each day. But today, we're talking about the content creation side. This is a slide that I've showed many, many times. I think I started with this at Cloudinary at the ImageCon or something like this. This is another way to look at supply chain and just how I view it in general. Shot creation, you do stylization. But business enrichment, that's pretty much where we spend the vast majority of our conversations around DAM and PIMS and all that stuff. But today, we're up here. And there's this transformation gap, and this is pretty common. Um, you see this a lot in the Figma world, where you have people designing in Figma and doing content creation in Figma, and then they can't get out. So they're like locked into Figma. How do you get into, into the real world and the digital experience? So we're on the left side. Today, we're going to be talking about the NFL. So season kicked off. Love that. We got 32 franchises, largest sporting event in the world, which is the Super Bowl. and so. In this case, we're talking about a one-hour uh, SLA to distribute to channels after the outcome of the game. Remember, they are event-driven, and so the outcomes of games and what happens can dictate what goes on in the market pretty rapidly. So you have that going on. And here's another real fun one. So now, look at what's going on on the phone. When you're forced to upgrade to the app, you've got light and dark mode on your native phone, right? And you've got you're going to either opt in or opt out of personalized ads. I struggle with this one all the time because when you get ads that just don't really appeal, to, you're going to get ads, right? So it's like, do you want them to give you personalized ads or not? Not really sure. And then you got lo location services. So you think about all this data that's coming at you. And this is very real, right? So you've got light mode and dark mode. Where are we at? We can presume maybe franchise or team affiliation. Down in the right corner, we also have visual impairments. And I put that on the side as being small on purpose because we rarely get to that space. Um, that's something I'm super passionate about. I have a slight visual impairment, so I have a great deal of empathy for people who have trouble seeing. But just think about all those as data inputs. So think about what we're going to do. How are we going to pull this off? 
So typically you're talking about planning way ahead, maybe the time to market's eight months. We're gonna staff up, right? We need mean to have some robust security because we don't want anybody seeing the content until the, the actual results of the game. So we're gonna maybe predict outcomes and do variations. No, we're not doing any of that. That's what we used to do. Okay, we used to take like eight months to get to market. You had to predict the future, hope, hope you get it right. And of course, there's never any change, right? Creative directors don't ever change their mind of what they wanna do, right? It's locked in. Okay, so here's a solution, robotics. It's the code business. This is not sped up. This is robotics sitting on top of a UI. We're grabbing assets. We're unpacking assets to the layer level. The layer level. Okay, we're going all the way down to the bottom of the ocean in Photoshop. Automatically being cataloged. This is now going through, putting metadata at the layer level. Okay? The gaming industry has figured this out a long time ago. I spent 10 years in Maya doing, uh, doing 3D. And technical directors, when you're, when you're doing shots in 3D, they don't hand move everything, like Avatar, right? James Cameron's like every blade of grass, they don't literally draw the blade of grass. You use programs to draw grass. You'd use programs to do wind simulation and all those things. The gaming industry figured this out a long time ago. So what you're looking at is automation, grabbing stuff from the dam, unpacking it, normalizing this so that we have something that becomes predictable. On the left side here, you've got your general, uh, maybe business query controls. So this is where you can grab uh, assets from the dam, what kind of personalization do you want, what tagging are you gonna go after. On the right side is creative enrichment. So it's like this is where you would see Photoshop layers, things of that nature. You've got filters, overlays, and then controls. Controls is very similar to the 3D world where they use this concept of rigging. And rigging is when you, uh, you can grab a character's arm and when you move it like this, the whole arm is changing because it's rigged, okay? That's a rig. And so this is what, so you've got rigging controls going on here. Now, this is important because we're starting to normalize what's coming into the dam because we need to get it to be predictable. When you start operating across your entire brand, you need some predictability. Now we're starting to go into dark mode. We're starting to predict, uh, uh, set the foundation for being able to have multiple style variations. And that's what's happening up here in the corner. You're not gonna see a lot of this because this is where the humans come back in. This is not about replacing creativity at all. This is about automating the place to where you can get centralized creative director control, okay? We're gonna have a game. It's gonna happen, right? And so what we need to be able to do is be in the moment with creatives to be able to create that energy, but do it rapidly. So the total runtime on this, by the way, is about 27 minutes. Think about that, 27 minutes. What you're seeing right now, think about how long that would take to open each Photoshop file, unpack it, prepare it, assuming you can even get to that state. Right? So this is 27 minutes to basically set you up for what's gonna happen at the end of the game. Where it gets super fun is when once you start your, normaliz your normalization and you get it within that bounds of control, now we can start to prepare texturized pieces. Stuff that normally would be drawn by hand is now able to be uh, applied. And this is where you see stuff like Mid Journey or Dolly. I don't know if you guys have seen a lot of that stuff. Um, that, look at that. That was not human touched, okay? But it's prepared, right? It's prepared as a layer that the, that the director can reach in and grab those and start applying those in mass to create this style variation. 
how this is actually all working is through CSS. So now you're talking about using CSS, which is how we drive all of our web experiences now, is propagating into the pixels. Think about that for a moment. <clears throat> that world has existed for a long time. There is so much power in CSS. Then what you've got wrapped around this whole thing, notice that the entire DOM is changing all of this. This is because you're in a framework, okay? This happens to be Vue. It doesn't really matter what the framework is. But all of those uh, frameworks have already figured out how to use CSS to tether into all of this stuff. The reason why the whole DOM is changing is because you want the creative directors to have the context of what they're operating in. When you see um, creative tools and they have this gray kind of outline, I'm not against that, by the way. But man, there's been so many times where you go deep into creativity and you have this beautiful image. And then all of a sudden, when you drop it into the context of the full web page, you see a square and it's out of place. So what you're getting here is the ability to then see everything in the context that you have it to. The other thing, too, is the, creative, or the, the tech side of this world with CSS, you never declare your colors. You have a primary. You have a secondary. Like, look, if you go to Google Material Design, you have a single place where you have your hex code that propagates to your entire brand experience. Right? If you think about it, that's Starbucks. Let's just take. Starbucks has a very distinct color. You really want to have one single place where you're defining that color. So let's look a little bit about the outcome here of what we just saw. All right, now, that looks weird. But the reason why is because now it's completely dynamic. OK? We haven't applied any type of uh, colors. It's also a little bizarre because in the NFL world, they're very distinct about their colors with teams. Um, but there's this funny story um, going way back, a president of consumer products, Andy Mooney, told. Um, he took, uh, I'm going to get all this wrong, Mickey Mouse plush dolls or whatever. I don't do plush, so sorry. Um, he basically had this idea where he was going to change the Mickey Mouse plush dolls to be all white. And he wanted to, um, in the middle of one of the stores, stack them up like a Christmas tree. And the powers that be at Disney freaked out. Because God forbid you're going to change the color of Mickey Mouse. Turns out it was one of the hugest selling points they've ever had. right? And that like, really set the bar. It's like when you think outside the box and you're trying to move product, people like experiences. So um, you know, for the NFL, <laughs> It's like some people would see this would be a little shocked. But look at what you got now. So now you're starting to apply color. Now I'm the human and I'm the creative director. I'm coming in. Uh, this is normalization. And by the way, for me, you know, going way back, um, I remember coloring books when I was a kid. And when I saw a coloring book, all I saw was like open opportunity to go crazy. So it was like candy. It's like, it's like the foundation, right? So this is also your normalization. It's not coming out that great on this screen. It doesn't really matter. But you can see that they're all kind of in a, the vicinity to then be somewhat of a blank palette. It's almost like a starting point, right? Normalization, but dark mode. As much as you think that this is this, it is not, OK? When you go into dark mode, there's all kinds of things that happen. Um, so you can uh, basically look at it this way. So sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. On the right side, now you have the, um, all the unified layers that are under your control. I'm going to show that in a little bit. But what I want to call out, because I'm going to forget, is there's this concept of I can operate on all of these at the same time, or I can select one. And now I'm back in Photoshop mode, where I'm basically you know, able to do the common stuff that you would think you would do. So you have global control as well as individual overrides. Again, coming back to this, uh, the glows, when you start to go into light mode and dark mode, remember we saw that on the slide. 
I don't know how, how many of you have dark mode on your phone. Like, I love dark mode. I can't go back. It's like I feel like I'm getting blasted by light. Um, it's all about lighting. So if you look at this, you've got a lot of glowing going on. You have a lot of uh, gradients happening, as opposed to something like this, um, when you're looking at shadows, because you have a light source, right? And then this, right? This is where I haven't even started scratching the surface on starting to leverage all the texturization that's going on. But um, what's fascinating to me about this when you get into it is you really start to see the strategy style of a particular logo and how, how it holds up to dynamicism. It's, it's amazing, because when you get into this, you, just, you can do this stuff all day long. Um, let's see. I want to show one other thing before I forget. Um, so Star Wars. Um, this is going to show you a little bit of the power of being able to operate on everything at once. So now you have your core controls here and the ability to turn on and off. That's super, I don't know if you're good. Yeah, you can see it slightly. This, and by the way, creative directors are into this level of detail, trust me. And you take something like that, you've got all your blend modes, switch it over to color Josh, because we're going to go for some sort of, you know, kind of uh, rough look. And then you've got opacity across all of it. The other thing, too, sorry, I'm going to be mindful of time, is notice the commonalities underneath the two right sides, right? Like, are you really going to open the Photoshop file and do that stuff in both by hand? Think about how expensive it is to do that. All right. Uh, let's see. Again, coloring book, love this. Centralized creative director level control, right? How does this work? So primitives going down. These are the individual layer levels. Primitives are gold because they are your atom of your universe, right, is the center of where you can start. And you only have to do this once. If you go down to the, where you, the starting point and you put metadata layer at that level, you only do it once because everything from then on out is just processing. This is uh, the baselining, obviously. This is trying to get everything to where we can uh, get it to where it somewhat behaves the same across each particular um, asset that you have. Talked about that, okay. So before I jump into this, because this usually scares everybody, you don't need to know any of this. So this is for the tech heads that are out there. Um, it's really <laughs> strange the reaction that you get when you start showing some of this stuff. Um, how does this work, okay? So really, it's like, how can we have the ability to pass around this data? And this is what's going on under the hood. This is very similar to um, what they're doing in front-end frameworks where uh, you don't, when you're in CSS, you don't want to say, you know, margin padding right, two point uh, padding left. They have these, like, tight things. So where you can say MX, which is like margin X direction two, right? Margin Y, MY, margin direction two. Right? So it's MY2, give me padding in the vertical layer. That's what this is. So if you keep your eye, let's see, let's pick this accent color right here. Watch what happens to accent. And before I do this, note, this is not um, vector. This is rasterized. See that? So when you start seeding your layers um, with this kind of information, Optica knows what to do with it. You're basically telling, you're basically starting to add intelligence into the creative files coming out of your workshops. And so it's the concept of putting uh, CSS-like shorthand inside of your layers. So you can say I underscore CLA, which means color accent. So then when you take it all the way to your website, it's looking at your global brand layers for the accent hex color and then it's applying that hex color to that layer. Um, oh, here's another one. By the way, all of this is 
open source, this is renderers. You, can, you guys can log into this. You can upload your files and all that stuff. Asset class. Um, uh, doing this work for Shop Disney, and the challenge with Shop Disney was the dynamicism of um, trying to have a personalized experience with so many products. But when you look at the innate structure of a shot, and a shot to me is um, something that you're doing. A shot is a, what you guys would call an asset, but to me, shots as opposed to frames, frames are for motion, all of those things. But mostly, you're talking about what is, what is the shot and the architecture of a shot. This classification is pretty global in nature, and there's a hierarchy here. So in other words, when you have a hero that's like this, it can hold a scene, and a scene is multiple models, right? But when you're like this, down in the corner, you should never put a scene in there because you can't see it. It's too small. So if you have asset class on your stuff, you can have intelligence to where the UI can know to never put an image that is not visual in that box. Anyway, reach out to me on that one because I know that this is where I start to lose everybody. Um, Okay, Optica is not, is not Photoshop, this is not Figma, this is not layout design, this is not DCO. For those people who don't know what DCO is, it's basically when you go to market and you do ads and you um, try to optimize a particular ad layout um, for a particular user. So there's also the confusion in this space with people doing that. When you see, anytime people start to see automation in robots, they think about either CMP, which is content management platforms, or DCO. This is not any of that. This is actually the tile at the pixel level. So Optica automates redundant tasks coming to all creative workflow. And this is really the takeaway. So I don't know if you guys want to take a screenshot of this. Um, you're basically converting brand into primitives and normalizing them into an open source language that the downstream systems can manipulate. So it doesn't matter if you're uh, Chili Pub, Seltra, whatever. Um, you can basically then enrich this as you go down. Um, and we're building, as we said, rigs, query-based. Important is the query-based mechanisms because if you start to try to hand stitch this together with metadata that's actually very rigid, it doesn't work, it doesn't scale. And then we're leveraging the DOM because we want the utmost security possible. There are certain situations where you cannot go to the server because you're so super secret. We talked about Star Wars and not being able to see the assets that are in the dam. So if you can start operating in the DOM and you don't have to go to the cloud or storage, then there's a lot of that. Um, you might want to take a screenshot of this. I'm not going to talk through this, but there's an, a lot of energy going into the security models around this, and you have uh, control over all levels of security. So you can have an account level where you're, uh, if you're a professional and you work with multiple clients, then you can control um, what clients are seeing what. Um, and then gallery abstraction. Sorry, let me, let me bounce back into that one. I'm going to go to the home page. And uh, I'm not going to be able to do this on the fly. I'm not going to even try it. Look at that. There's nothing there. Okay. All of the stylistic abstraction lives in this gallery. So the point of this is that you can t we get a new asset. We farm out to an agency. We have them using the language we just talked about. So now they're shipping their finished work in here. You can drag it in here, and it will style itself. Okay? You can look up a previous talk. I've shown this many, many times. Um, but it's a, And the reason why I bring this up is because it's a huge point that is often overlooked. That's what a gallery is. A gallery is a stylistic abstraction for your brand. It's like, what is our brand really? What is our brand really? It's not this image. It's the colorization, it's the textures, all of those things. So when a, a new, when a new creative flows into the damn universe, you just drop it in there and the processing automatically happens. Real quick, wrapping up. Um, Josh Tomorrow runs Parks. Um, it's really interesting on these leadership levels that somebody way up the food chain is able to convey a vision or some sort of motivational factor. So this came from Josh Jamara. He was saying, I dare you. I dare you to be innovative. I dare you to be groundbreaking, OK? So I have a message back to Josh if we're here at the camera. So Josh, I dare you. 
I dare you to start making everything compliant for those with visual impairments. Like I tried for so many years to get that stuff off the ground. I'm no longer with Disney, love Disney. Thank you, Disney. But uh, um, my parting words for Disney is like, let's support those people with visual impairments, okay? I've been working on that stuff for a long time. Thank you guys, appreciate it, all right.